between says yajna valkaya and maitri the present section is a narration of the conversation that appears to have taken place in ancient times between the says yajna valkaya and his consort maitri last time i in my previous video i have given the st this uh, story of yajnavalkya and how he was to go into retirement from the worldly life so that i have already given in the previous video so i am now here yajna valka says i am going to retire from the life of a householder and enter into the fourth order of life as we know in hinduism the life of a person of 100 years is divided into four parts each of 25 years first is brahmacharya that is celibacy second grahast householder third one prastha going to jungle or retire from the worldly life sanyasa leaving everything except god now continue i therefore am now intending to arrange the division of property between you and katyani katyani was his second wife before taking to the final stage of life the life of a renunciation this is the expression of says yajnavalkya to his consort maitri between maitri and katyani two consorts i shall make the division of property when the idea of property arose immediately it appeared to have stirred up a brain wave in the mind of the wise maitre she queries you speak of entering the fourth order of life embracing a new perspective of living all together and therefore you propose to divide the property between the two of us here so that we may be comfortable and happy is it possible for us to be happy ultimately through property is it possible to be perpetually happy by possession of material comfort and property this is matrix question see matrix and kapyani Maitreya was more inclined towards spiritualism 
Katyani was a, you know, she was more interested in the worldly life. So this is the difference between two ladies. Okay. The intention of Yajna Valkya to leave secular property to his consorts naturally means that he proposes to leave them in a state of satisfaction and immense comfort. But is this practicable? Can we be eternally happy, unbrokenly satisfied? Can there be a cessation of our happiness at any time? The question simply put is, is it possible to give immortality through wealth? So, wealth cannot give immortality. So, if I am the owner of the entire earth, the wealth of the whole world is mine. Will I be perpetually happy or will there be some other factor which will intrude upon my happiness in spite of my possession of the values of the entire world? This is the question put by, this is the query put, uh, this, uh, put by Matri. This is the question. You will be very comfortable. No, replies Yajna Valpe. You cannot be happy. You will be very comfortable as is the case with people who own a lot of wealth. But you would be in the same state in other respects as is the condition of well-placed people in society. Immortality is not possible through possessions. It is a different status altogether, which has no connection with any kind of relativistic association. There is no hope of immortality through wealth. Now see here the word immortality means we are out of the cycle of death and birth. So that is the state of liberation. See, do not misunderstand these impurities for the body. No, yet people misunderstand this conception. Immortality is nothing but we get rid of the cycle of birth and death. See, some people they think you know the immortal means they we will carry on living forever. With this body, no, this body is perishable. It will vanish one day. So it is made of matter and matter is perishable. So just we have to be very careful. Then what is the good of all this? If one day death is to swallow me up and transiency is to overwhelm me, impermanence of the world is to threaten us and if everything is to be insecure at the very start, if all that you regard as worthwhile is, after all, going to be a phantom, because it is not going to assure us as to how long it can be possessed, how it may not be taken away from us, and at what time we shall be dispossessed of all the status that we have in life. If this is the uncertainty of all existence, what good can accrue to me from this end that you are bestowing upon me as if it is a great value? So, this, this is the, you know, doubt Matre is heavy. The, these, all the property, the, it can be snatched by some means then it is not certain it will never remain forever and moreover this body will not remain forever. So what is the use of having all this pro property? <coughs> so she says further, 
what am i to do with that thing which is not going to make me perpetually happy immortal satisfied so whatever you know in this contest see us and us band whatever you know in this contest oh lord tell me that she is requesting her husband to explain what else can we do let me be cured of this illness of doubting in my mind so that i may know what it is that i have to engage myself in if i am to be eternally happy means she is asking what should i do so that forever i will remain happy so that there can be no fear from any source is it a possibility if it is a possibility what is the method that i have to adopt in the acquisition of this supreme final satisfaction very wonderful question yagna walka was highly pleased with this query i never expected that you will put this question to me when i am leaving you immense property bestowing upon you a lot of wealth <coughs> so so yagna walka was surprised he thought that both of my wives they will be happy to have a large sum of property but he was surprised when madrei put question for happiness she was not happy with the property she was not interested to have the part of property she was interested for everlasting happiness so she further says now yajna walka says yajna walka replies listen to me with rapt attention i shall tell you the secret of this great problem that you have posed before me the question that you have put the difficulty in the ascent on the part of people to become permanently happy which is not possible by possession of wealth see all the upnished their main thing is how to realize the self <coughs> how to realize brahma now says yajna walka um further says now the whole subject is a discourse on the relationship that obtains between eternally and temporality what you call immortality is the life eternal and that which is temporal is what we see with our eyes see here immortality means soul is free from this cycle of birth and death and what we see with our eyes the things which are visible to our eyes they can never provide eternal happiness because what we can see means everything that is made of matter and matter can never be permanent so wealth is a general term which signifies any kind of value and possession it may be a physical possession it may be a psychological condition or it may be a social status all these come under wealth because anything that gives you comfort physical and social can be regarded as property this is what is known as temporal 
value it is temporal because it is in the context of the time process that which is temporal is that which is conditioned by time see remember soul and god they are beyond space and time but all the things made of matter they are conditioned by space and time the time process is involved in the possession of values that are called temporal so time has a say in the matter of our possessions we cannot completely defy the law of time and take hold of possession that we regard as ours time is inscrutable force which is a peculiar arrangement of things in the world that arrangement is known as temporality the arrangement of things is such in the temporal realm that things cannot be possessed by anyone the idea of possession is a peculiar notion in the mind you know very well how far the idea of possession is see how can we possess things forever the say for example things may remain forever but our body will never remain forever so possession is not at all this possible because things as well as our body all these things are perishable and anything which is perishable can never remain forever only atma and god remain forever not perishable so the simple thing you cannot possess anything except in thought so what we call ownership of property is a condition of the mind i can give you a very small gross example this is a large expansion of land a vast field which is agricultural in itself today you say it is owned by a and tomorrow it is owned by b by transfer of property now what do you mean by this transfer of property it has never been transferred it is there in its own place it has been transferred in the ideas of people one person called a imagined that it was his yesterday and today another called b thinks in his mind that it is his now both ideas whether it is the idea of a or the idea of b are peculiar inscrutable conditions which cannot be easily associated with the physical existence of the property known as land there is no vital connection between the thought of the person and the landed property there is only an imaginary connection but the social arrangement of the idea of ownership is such that it appears to be well placed there is an agreement among people that certain ideas should be accepted as logically valid that is called temporal law man made law is temporal law and it is valid as long as people who are concerned with it agree that is valid but if it is not agreed upon then the validity of the that principle ceases so when the acceptance on the part of minds of people in respect of a principle called ownership ceases then the ownership also ceases for example there is no ownership in a jungle the beast do not possess any property animals have no idea of ownership they go anywhere at any time today the animal is in one place tomorrow it is in another place and we to live in a similar manner we are in one place today and tomorrow in a another place
The difference is we think in a particular manner, whereas animals think not in that manner. The whole question of ownership or psychologically put like or dislike is a condition of the mind which is an arrangement of psychological values agreed upon by a group of people who have decided that this should be the state of affairs. So you can imagine how artificial is the idea of ownership. Nobody can own anything unless it is agreed upon by the concerned people that this idea be accepted. If the idea is not accepted, then the ownership goes because you cannot swallow the land or eat the property. It is there physically existent as something not mechanically related to you, but psychologically a phantom of your mind. This being the case, how can that bring permanent satisfaction? If a thing can be permanently possessed, you cannot be dispossessed of it. The very fact that can be dispossessed of a property shows that permanent acquisition is not possible. It is conditionally connected with you in a psychological manner and it cannot be connected unconditionally and what you call permanent happiness is unconditional existence independent of temporal relationship. That unconditional existence is not possible if it is in effect of a conditional arrangement. So, eternity that is aspired after which is what we know as immortality is something trans-empirical and not conditioned by the process of time and it has nothing to do with the ownership of property. You may possess or you may not possess. It is absolutely immaterial as far as the question of immortality is concerned because Immortality is not dependent upon connection of values external. It is a state of being as such. In order to inculcate the meaning of this great passage, Yajna Valkya tells us, this is a very long passage, all of which brings out the point that the connection which a mind has with any particular object is inscrutable. If it is taken literally, it has an esoteric, deep, profound significance. A mind cannot be really connected with an object if the object is externally placed outside the mind because the mind and the object are dissimilar in their character. The object is physical, the mind is psychological, the mind is internal, the object is external, the mind is psychological and the object is physical. A connection between these two is unthinkable and so all affections of the mind, positive or negative, are certain internal operations that occur within the mind and bear no real vital relation to objects outside. But why does it appear that they have some connection if the connection is not really there? Why do we appear to be happy in our mind when certain objects are possessed, desirable things are owned by us as we think in our minds? What is the meaning of owning, possessing, enjoying, loving, etc.? What is the actual significance of this idea in the mind? Why is it that suddenly there is a surge of happiness in the mind when one feels there is a possession of desirable value? This happiness arises on account of a confusion in the mind. This is what the sage Yajna Valkya will tell us. This is a happiness 
which is tentatively the outcome of a transformation that takes place in the mind on account of an imagined question connection of the mind with the object that is desired to and possessed the happiness is not the condition of the object that is possessed it is a condition of the mind but that condition which is the prerequisite of the condition of happiness is made possible by a new notion that arises in the mind in respect of the object which is a very intricate psychological point why does why does an idea arises in the mind why is it that you regard certain objects as unavailable and others as otherwise what is that makes a particular object desirable and acceptable and valuable and capable of becoming instrumental in creating this satisfaction in the mind that is a very great secret how is it possible that a particular imaginary connection of the mind with an externally placed object can become the source of happiness within this happiness on account of the presence of something else which the mind cannot cognize and as long as the presence of this particular something is not recognized there would be sorrow as an outcome eventually or immediately as a result of this external relationship this is a notion in the minds of people that happiness arises on account of the contact of the mind with desirable objects that this is not true is a great point that is made out here happiness does not merely arise on account of the contact of the mind with an object which is desirable for this purpose another question may have to be answered we shall leave aside for the time being the question as to how a desirable desirable object becomes instrumental in creating satisfaction in the mind why does an object appear desirable desirable at all is the primary question then only comes the question as to how it becomes instrumental in creating happiness see here happiness and pleasure these are the things anything liked by mind that is actually pleasure anything which is liked by soul that is happiness the very nature of our soul is happiness that is known as bliss anand because our soul is sat chit anand sat chidanand that is existence consciousness and bliss so happiness is connected with soul and pleasure with the mind this is the simple that desirability of the object is again a condition of the mind it is a perception of the mind in the contour of the object of certain characters which are necessitated by the mind the mind is a pattern of consciousness so you remember in my other video i have explained how mind and our atman connected see all the thoughts they arise from our soul and continuously rising of thoughts give rise to the mind remember and when this you know this this mind is actually non existent it it does not exist because these are the thoughts which constitute this mind and thoughts 
arise from our soul. So mind itself is non-existent, it is temporary, it is perishable. It is because when the mind is destroyed, we say we realize our soul. Till the mind is there, ego is there, we cannot realize our soul. That is the this mind, ego, they are the veil between, they are covering our soul rather. You may call it a focused form of consciousness, a shape taken by consciousness. Something like the shape of the waters of the ocean may take in the surge of the waves. A particular arrangement of consciousness in space and time may be said to be a mind whether it is a human mind or otherwise. This particular arrangement of consciousness is naturally finite. Every particularized shape or form is finite, merely because of the fact that it is so particularized. The particularization of the mind is the isolation of that character of the mind from other characters which are equally existent uh, elsewhere in other objects. When I say there is such a thing called red, it means there can be other things which are not red. So, a particular state of mind becomes finite in its nature on account of other such conditions or different conditions being made possible. So, the Finitude of the mind becomes a source of restlessness to the mind. Every restlessness is psychological and is due to a finitude felt in the mind. <clears throat> but this finitude brings about a limitation that is imposed upon itself by the factor that it is finitude itself. If you want to overstep the limit of the boundaries that are set upon you, so the mind tries to jump over its own skin as it were in trying to grab objects which it imagines to have the characteristics which are the counterparts of that it feels it has lost. The finitude of the mind it is felt can be made good by the character that the mind imagines to be existing in the objects that are desirable. <coughs> it imagines for certain reasons that a particular object or a particular group of objects or a certain set of circumstances are made in such a way that they have <coughs> characters which are exactly the complement or supplement or the counterpart or the correlative of its own finitude. Or you may say it is something like a square rod beholding a square hole in its presence of a similar shape. If the square rod possesses a round hole, there, is, there cannot be attraction. If the round rod sees a round hole, there can be attraction. <coughs> There should be a counterpart of the values of attraction to <coughs> arise. One finitude should be believed capable of being made good by another finitude and then there is attraction. The world is made in such a way that there are infinite varieties of finitude and one set of values which goes to make up the finitude of a particular mind becomes the source of summoning the opposite of these values which are <coughs> imagined to exist in another finitude, say an object. So the world is said to be relative in the sense that everything is related to everything else. Unless a particular finite situation is <coughs> related to another particular finite situation which is going to be the complementary aspect of it. There cannot be a sense of fullness. 
the sense of fullness is the source of satisfaction satisfaction and sense of fullness are identical when you feel incomplete in yourself you are unhappy when you feel complete you are happy the feeling of incompleteness arises on account of the notion that something is lacking in you the sense of lack of something arises because there is a sudden emergence of certain notions in the mind in respect of values of which it becomes conscious and so it cannot be that a particular person will be feeling the same sense of finitude at all times it does not mean that you will be wanting the same thing thorough throughout your life the idea of finitude goes on changing as you arise in the process of evolution as the mind gets transformed gradually day by day stage by stage in the process of evolution the requirements of the mind also change and this is why every day you desire different object not the same object you cannot have one particular thing today and be happy forever that is not possible because the mind cannot rest in one condition it cannot rest because there is evolution there is physical evolution and psychological evolution both are taking place simultaneously so this perception of a counterpart of the finitude of mind in a given condition is caused by the desirability of an object felt by the mind then what happens immediately the mind says here is the source of my fulfillment and wish is to come in contact with, with it as soon as possible so that it may become a part of its being <clears throat> the desire of the mind for a particular desirable object is a desire to get united with that object in its being so the idea of possession is something very strong indeed it is actually a desire to get united with the object so that you become physically psychologically whole in being and not merely in an external relation the condition is however not possible as you cannot enter into the being of any object therefore there is no such satisfaction even after the full fulfillment of a desire no desire can be fulfilled eternally whatever be the effort that you put forth because it is not possible for you to enter into the being of that object the intention is good but it is impracticable nobody can enter into the existence of an object because the object is externally placed in space and time so it is a futile attempt on the part of the mind to enter into any object then there is a struggle on the part of the mind to possess the object become the object make it a part of its being by assimilation of its being into its own however it is a fruitless attempt because the operation of space and time will prevent the entry of one into the other that is why this world is a sorrow and it shall be a sorrow there shall be a perpetual effort on the part of people to grab objects and try to enjoy them but they cannot enjoy them there can only be a mere appearance of enjoyment not real enjoyment the love that you feel in respect of an object is in fact the love that you feel towards that which is called perfection and completeness it is not really a love for the object you have thoroughly misunderstood the whole point even when you are clinging to a particular object as if it is the source of satisfaction 
the mind does not want an object if it wants completeness of being that is what is searching for thus when there is a promise of the fulfillment that it seeks through the perception of an object that appears to be its counterpart there is a sudden feeling that fullness is going to come and there is a satisfaction even on the perception of the object and there is an apparent satisfaction just by the imagined possession of it together with the yearning of actual possession so what is that you are asking for you are not asking for any object or thing you are asking for a condition of completeness in your being so my dear friend says yajna walkya nobody is dear no object can be regarded as lovable or desirable it is something else that you love and are asking for but by a notion that is completely misconstrued you believe that the object is loved so <clears throat> what you love is a completeness of being which is reflected in the condition fell to exist between yourself and the object concerned you must mark this point what you love is only the condition that you imagine to be present in the state of the possession of the object but that state can never be reached for the reason already mentioned so nothing is dear in this world what is dear is the condition which you intend to create or project in your own being by an imagined contact with the object so not one person is dear in this world but what is dear is that condition which is imagined to be present after the possession of that object or that relationship <clears throat> now what are these objects every blessed thing yajna walkya goes on with his exposition to maitrey neither the husband is dear to the wife nor the wife is dear to the husband what is dear is a condition which they try to bring about in their mind by that relation the condition is always missed and so the happiness expected never comes <clears throat> after enumerating many things that are usually conceived as dear and desirable in this world but which are actually not the source of real satisfaction to a person yagna walkya says nothing external gives you happiness because it is not the things alone that is the source of happiness but something else which is always missing due to a confusion of thought for the desire of the infinite which is this self everything appears to be desired here the word atman is to be understood in the sense of the totality of being it is the self food of all beings a great subject which we have studied in detail in the fourth section of the first chapter see this conversation you know it is in the brahmadarnika upanishad so it is part of brahmadarnika upanishad for the sake of this supreme absolute which is the self of all things you are unknowingly asking for things you have missed the point in asking for the things of the world so it is a wild goose chase from birth to death nothing coming forth ultimately you come to this world crying and you go crying because you have missed the whole point in the tremendous effort that you have put forth throughout your life entirely by nothing <clears throat> 
सो ओ मत नाउ फर्दर रियाज देने वाले थे आप सेज से ओ मैथ्री इट इज द आत्मा दैट इज टू बी द हेल्ड इट इज द आत्मा वेरी सोल दैट इज टू बी नोन इट इज द आत्मा दैट इज टू बी सर्चड फॉर इट इज द आत्मा विच इज टू बी हर्ड अबाउट इट इज द आत्मा विच इज टू बी थॉट इन द माइंड इट इज द आत्मा विच इज टू बी मेडिटेटेड अपॉन देर इज नाथिंग एल्स वर्थ वाइल थिंकिंग नाथिंग एल्स वर्थ वाइल पोजेसिंग बिकॉज नाथिंग वर्थ वाइल एग्जिस्ट अदर देन दिस दिस मीन्स आत्मा सो हैप्पीनेस इज कनेक्टेड विद आत्मा ओनली Rest, it is the thoughts only. Relations are just in the mind. Mind is temporary, so that happiness is temporary. That is not actually happiness. Happiness and bliss. That is the nature of our atma. If you can grasp the significance of what this atma is. you have known everything and then you have possessed everything you have become all the see know thyself know your atma realize your atma then you will have happiness forever this is the gist of all this thing there is nothing left to desire afterwards when we know our atma we realize our atma there is nothing desirable left over and if this is not to be achieved what is going to be your fate suppose you do not have this knowledge everything shall leave you one day or the other today this goes tomorrow that goes and the history of humanity has told us repeatedly that you cannot lay trust upon anything you have seen things coming and things going today it is there tomorrow it is not there you cannot know what will happen tomorrow and what will be the status and the state of things at any moment of life time everything shall desert a person if he is bereft of this knowledge because they are not a part of his being how can they be with in all see the being remember being means atma do not misunderstand being being the word being that is atma that which is not you cannot be possessed by you that which is not you really cannot be a property of yours that which is not you cannot be with you always therefore it shall leave you but why do you cry if anything goes away and there is bereavement loss etc it is quite natural to lose them it is exactly as things ought to be things which are outside you do not belong to you therefore it is no use crying over them what is the difficulty what is the problem and why are you worrying about it if they become so you they cannot leave you because you cannot be dispossessed of yourself you are dispossessed of only those things which are not yours this point you must understand Finally, the Upanishad says here the Upanishad means Brahmadharma ka Upanishad. Everything shall leave you if you regard anything as other than you. It is a metaphysical point, a psychological theme, and a practical truth. You cannot forget this. Anything that is outside you cannot belong to you and cannot satisfy you, and it will leave you. So. it shall bring you sorrow it is a point which is eternally true all things shall desert you one day or the other even those things which you regard as dearest and nearest most desirable and valuable shall desert you and leave you 
bringing sorrow because they do not belong to you. So, so Maitri says Yajnaraka, it is the Atma that appear as all these things. This is the point that is never grasped by the mind which looks upon objects as independent entities. The Atma is the one reality that masquerades in various forms and names, but this point is not understood. The mind that is finite, located and lost in the body does not understand the fact that finite objects that are outside are only appearance of a single individual reality. So, the finite tries to cling to the finite, not knowing this fact of infinitude that is at the background of these finite forms. If this infinitude that is at the base of these finite forms is to be understood, realized and made part of one's own being, then the realization accrues. This Atma is all. In Sanskrit we call it Idam Sarvam Yad Ayam Atma. <coughs> By these three illustrations, says Yajnavalya tells us that the effect cannot be known unless the cause is known. Because the effect is a manifestation of the cause in some proportion. You cannot understand the nature of any object in this world unless you know where from it has come. But you try to understand the why and wherefore things by merely beholding them with the eyes. Whatever be the extent of your observation in the best laboratory conceivable in the world, you cannot understand things because whatever is to whatever is observed through even the subtlest instrument, even the best microscope, etc., is an effect, not a cause. It is a product of certain circumstances. The condition that have been responsible for the effectuation of these forms that you are observing are transcendent and therefore they are invisible. Unless the cause behind the form that is visible is perceived, the form cannot be really known. If you are intent upon knowing the nature of any object, you must know its relation to something else and that something else is connected to another thing and so on and so on until you will be surprised to realize that everything is connected to everything else in such a way that nothing can be known unless everything is known. So, it is not possible to have complete knowledge of any finite object unless the infinite itself is known. You cannot know the structure of even a sand particle in the beach unless the whole cosmos is known ultimately because it has got infinite relationships to various types of atmosphere of which it is a product. So, it will take you up to the limit of the infinite if you try to understand the inner inscrutable majesty of even a grain of sand. To understand this, the great master Yajna Valkaya gives us three illustrations. Just as the sound that is made by a percussion instrument cannot be properly identified if the instrument itself is far away and not visible to the eye, but whose sound is heard by you from a distance unless you catch the source there of, just as you cannot identify the rhythm produced by the blowing of a conch, unless you have the capacity to grasp the totality of the sound by actually 
perceiving the conch that is being blown at any particular time. Just as you cannot understand the symphony produced by a veena or a stressed instrument, for instance, merely by hearing one note unless you are able to connect all the notes in a harmonious symphony. So is the case with all these things in the world. You cannot know anything. They are each like one note in the symphony or the music of the universe. How can you know the beauty of the music by merely hearing one note? That note is connected to many other notes. And when every note is harmoniously related to all other notes to which it is related and the, all the notes are grasped at one stroke in one single harmonious symphony, that becomes music. It is beautiful. But if only a tongue is heard or one tick is heard, it makes no sense. It is not music. Likewise, with any object in this world, it is one twang, one tick, one sound, which is really connected to a vast arena or a gamut of a symphony that is universally expansive. Unless the total expanse or continuity is grasped by the mind at one stroke, which means to say that unless the infinite being behind the finite object is grasped by the consciousness. No finite object can be known fully. Nothing can be understood perfectly. Therefore, nothing can give you satisfaction. There is no hope of immortality through any possession in this world, is the conclusion of sage Yajna Valkya. The sage Yajna Valkya says that the nature of effects cannot be known unless their cause is known. It is futile on our part to investigate into the nature of any finite object without correlating its form and contact with the causes which gave rise to its present form in a series which cannot be comprehended by the mind. Every link in a chain is connected with every other link. The pull or force exerted by the topmost link is felt by the lowermost link even if the chain be millions of miles in length, irrespective of the fact that the lowest link might not have even seen the very existence of the topmost link. The presence of that topmost link will be felt by the pressure it exerts through the age-long length of the chain, of which the lowermost link is a finite part. Even so is the nature of all finite things in the world, and we cannot understand the nature of anything unless we are in a position to understand everything at the same time. Either you know everything or you know nothing, that is the truth of all experience. There is no such thing as knowing something because that something is a false aspect of the organic connection with which it is related, minus its relation. Its very existence is not worth cognition at all. The nature of finite objects is very peculiar. They are constituted of the circumstances in which they are placed. So, that you cannot separate the circumstances and the nature of the thing itself. It is not true that the circumstances are outside and the thing is inside. It is a false con conclusion. Again, which the mind makes in its untutored attitude toward thing. The circumstances are a part of the existence of thing. And these circumstances are not conceptual notions in the mind. They are vital energies, powers. Even space is not an emptiness, as you know very well. It is as solid as a rock, for example, because under conditions which can be experimented upon, 
in the most solid of things can be converted into an ethereal substance so the circumstance of space around an object is not an unimportant aspect that can be separated from the existence of an object but the incapacity of the senses to perceive non physical objects and non physical conditions creates a false impression in the mind that the circumstances are completely isolated from the existence of an object this is why we make independent notional judgments about things distancing them from the condition